everyone, welcome. We've got Raswana Bashir here, co-founder and CEO of Peak. Very grateful for you to be here today with us and we're excited to learn a little bit about you and your experience as being CEO. Thank you, thanks so much for having me. And you have an office located in San Francisco and then an office also in Salt Lake City? We do, we do. So about 18 months ago, we opened a new office here in Utah and it's been an amazing place to be. And how long ago did you start Peak? Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Sure. Um, so I started Peak just about five years ago, uh, and the idea came from going to Istanbul for a weekend. Um, and I was looking for really fun things to do. I spent hours researching these activities and experiences, and then had to get on the phone to be able to organize any of them. Sure. And the whole process ended up being both frustrating and very lengthy. Uh, I wondered why something like Open Table didn't exist for all the things you want to do. Right. Um, and you know, as I started digging into the space, I realized it was a $110 billion market. It was very, very large, but still largely offline. And so I started building Pete.com. So it kind of checked to... all the boxes. Yeah, it did, it did. It needs um, to be disrupted, huge market. Completely, and, and, and mobile was gonna make a huge difference, right? Most consumers actually book an activity about six hours in advance. So people aren't doing, you know, paintballing or go-karting or, or horseback riding, any of these things. We might think about it earlier, but we don't book until the day of. Right. And so that really requires technology. And so does this translate then if you want to be inspired or be able to innovate or start a company? Step number one, go to Istanbul. I think Istanbul is a great place for anyone to go if you want to get inspired. Um, uh, but, you know, I think in general, we should all be traveling more and being exposed to more cultures um, because that's often how you begin to get out of your box. I think creative for creativity, um, um, being exposed to new cultures and new ideas is really important. Yeah. So yes, everyone should go out and do experiences and push themselves out of their boundaries. For sure, yeah. When you have a moment, you can start thinking and really yeah. be inspired. Of course. And actually, it's been shown that not only do experiences make you happier than buying products, so you, you will actually be happier because you're often doing them with people that you care about. Um, but if you actually push your boundaries, um, say you go skydiving or something that you actually are a little bit frightened of doing, right. um, you'll actually end up building a lot of kind of resilience and also um, that getting yourself out of the box will help you in terms of your ideas and your creativity. So it's, so it's good for you. When you're, what, was, what was your background before that? What kind of led you to that? Sure. Um, so I actually, um, from the UK, um, so I went to university in Oxford, um, studied economics and ended up going into finance, really thinking that that was what you did if you were you know, a reasonably smart kid who, who wanted to, to go into business. Right. Um, so I worked at Goldman and then Blackstone um, doing private equity for a few years and that was great for getting my business chops, but I didn't really feel like I was having an impact. I wasn't building anything. But you were definitely like recognizing like I need market size, I need a place to totally. a so, canvas big enough to play in. Totally. And it gave me like a good framework and structure to think about how to analyze business problems and things like that. Um, and then I came to America to go to business school. Um, and um, after business school, I just, as I was at business school actually, I started getting exposed to tech companies. Um, and I realized that there's this huge opportunity to have big impacts um, by creating something and putting it on the web um, and being able to touch millions of people. And so I really got excited about entrepreneurship and technology. And so I worked at a couple of startups in New York. And then um, this idea was something that had been kind of bubbling in my head for a while. Okay. And I moved to Silicon Valley and started working on it. So when you take all that background that you have though that I'm sure instructs the way that you think and has a big impact on how you analyze opportunities, do you find yourself forcing yourself to be more passionate and more about the experience versus thinking about the model and what might be appealing to investors someday or what, be, what might be appealing as a public company? How do you balance those things? I mean, I think it's, it's quite helpful to have that background because I think it's a rare of, though for entrepreneurs. Yeah, actually, you know what? I think I think it is. It, I think it is rare for entrepreneurs, but I think it's tremendously valuable if you do have it. For sure. And so, for but we, most of us have to learn that. Yeah, it's after true. making tons of mistakes. It's like true. my first I company was a, mistake as well. My first company was a hairbrush company. <laughs> Come to find out, distribution is important. Market size is important. I didn't know those things. Yeah. But you've had that. So yeah, how do you balance that? Well, I think, I think you're right. I think sometimes you can say no too quickly to something because logically or in your you know, rational frameworks, it doesn't work. Um, and um, I, think it's, I think the thing, I've never had a problem around the passion side of it. I really love what we do. Actually, so it's more just do. informed you yeah. as you've kind of been passionate, like you take it the correct direction. Completely, avoid and I think that the, um, the operational pieces are different anyway. So I'd not done necessarily, you know, I'd not 
run large teams before, I hadn't had to necessarily execute on the idea. Yeah. So more of that was what I had to learn, which was around kind of team building culture and all these pieces. But luckily, my co-founder actually has a background more on the tech side. So okay. he's an MIT grad who spent 15 years in the Valley building quite large enterprise software companies. And so that really helped because the two of us came together with these two different viewpoints, mine on the business side, his on technology. So the co-founding pairing was really important and has been really valuable for us because I think there's lots of skills that I don't have that Oscar has. 99, you guys would be able to raise a lot of money just by saying MIT, totally. Harvard, Oxford. It's true. Here's a PowerPoint. It's so, such poor fortune. <laughs> we, were, we were not able, you know, neither of us had graduated I think things have turned yet. out okay, yeah. though, yeah. right? Yeah, it's been okay. So you, I, I saw some of the awards that you've won. You've won some awards for under 30 awards. So I won't ask your age, but clearly you're very young. What uh, my experience hiring executives around me a lot of times they end up being older than you and that there's a dynamic there. I think if you're, especially as a wom woman who's also young, I think that that can be something where not everyone's been used to being in an environment where that's the case or even Not actually, everyone's worked for a woman who's younger than them. Indeed, and, 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 and actually on top of that, I think even personalities, right? So I think that people have expectations of the behavior of a woman versus a man, right? And so if, you know, I found that if I was tougher in an environment and, 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 and wasn't taking any, you know, BS, it was, it was something people weren't expecting because perhaps their expectation was that, that a female leader would have a different kind of relationship with them and stuff. So I think there are definitely a lot of preconceptions going in. Um, in the end, I think um, anyone who's willing to come in and interview to work with you is probably more open-minded than the average. And so I think as a result, the benefit's been someone who's been willing to work for a younger female CEO sure. also is probably a person that's really good for our culture. We're just gonna have to continue to have more women in positions of for leadership sure. where it's not surprising. Sometimes I've been in, in meetings with my co-founder and um, they would ask him some more of the questions around the business and the model. <laughs> really? And I think Oscar was quite gracious and just kind of said, oh, actually, Rizwan, I should probably answer that. <laughs> I'm really happy to talk more around the technology side and some of the other pieces, but um, I think it's been great to have So what goes partner. through your head when that happens? I think it's just... Um, do, you, I, do you give him a break or are you kind of like, yeah, you're, you're done? I'm no, I think, I think, you know, look, there's a real battle for today that we have in, the, sure. the, in, in, in venture and, and in, in entrepreneurship, which is there aren't enough women leaders. Mm -hmm. And so I think, like, I hope that the more that they see, you know, women who are hopefully creating really cool companies, um, the more that they will they will say, oh, wow, like, I, this, is, this is something that I need to look at more. So I tend to, you know, I think you can't in that scenario, um, you know, I think, you know, be... You have to be respectful of people sure. and understand that people so come from different... It's kind of cultural and we need to change yeah, and it's and I part think of it's, change. It's, and I hope that everybody will be part of that change. One of the things, I think the topic here, you're wearing a parity pledge um, badge. I think that's really important. And I think for all of us, you know, clearly there is a dynamic in a lot of workplaces that is not that friendly towards a certain gender. Let's, how do we help that? And I hope that I can, can help be a role model for others. When I was growing up, like there was no one that I knew that, that was a woman that, that worked. There was no one that I knew that had access to you know, going to Oxford or Cambridge. And so I think I realized how... So why did that happen with you? You know, it, I... Did it have anything to do with your parents, the way you're raised, or was it just you had this burning desire to be that? I think I, I really loved um, learning. I was really intellectually curious, was hugely nerdy. And so learning was such a big piece of what I enjoyed and loved at, at home. And, um, you know, when I was growing up. And so as a result, I had a... I was able to go to a school that was more selective. So it was still a public school, but yeah. it was one that, um, that my, one of my teachers had gone to Cambridge. Okay. And so it was amazing for me to see her and say, oh, wow, she's really good at math. And she went to Cambridge and maybe I could do that as well. So it was these small nuggets and opportunities that I had um, and my passion for learning that helped me get into Oxford and get a scholarship. And that actually completely changed my life. And then how have you run your organization? And I'm also curious about the diversity of your organization. Yeah. Is that something that kind of naturally it ends up being diverse because they see someone who's not the stereotypical and they feel comfortable being there if they're a little more diverse in nature? Yeah, I think we definitely get a huge amount of candidates that are female um, because of the the kind of dynamic that we have. So people can see, well, if, if the person at the top, the CEO, is a woman, then hopefully this is an environment where my gender is not going to matter. Actually, one interesting thing about Peak, partly because I think that we cater towards activities and experiences, it's people who are passionate about that. So we end up having a lot of people who love travel and actually a lot of people from a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm 
English. My co-founder is, is German. Um, we have people on our team that are French, Swedish, uh, Filipino, um, you know, this huge mix of cool. diversity of backgrounds as well. So that's very cool. So I think we both attract people from from you know a wide array of, of kind of social, socioeconomic backgrounds yep. as well as um, these different countries, and that gives us a huge diversity of thought as well, which I'm really grateful for. So, do you do you know what the data is? Do you have any idea on, on like yeah, percentage of your I mean, leaders that are w women or so of our executive minorities? team? Of our executive team, about half is female, which okay. is really great. Yep. Um, and one of the, the the people that we hired, she she's very senior um, in our in our team. Um, she was actually at Uber and a couple of other really big companies. In, in Silicon Valley and actually when she came to look for her, a new role for herself she decided she wanted to work for a female CEO oh, and cool. so that was a rarity for me and it was really wonderful that we were kind of being considered with her having a mindset which was I want to be in an organization where there's more female leadership and so she came to us precisely because of that so on the executive team that's the case and then you know within the rest of the team it's it's not 50 50 and it's something that I'd love to get towards so you've talked a little bit about data and and, and looking at the size of the company and certainly understanding the demographics, what have you, uh, what data do you look at when you're running your organization, when you're running the company? Yeah, um, a huge amount. So as an example, um, we have a sales team. So we have, um, one of the things that we do is we help you know, consumers to book great activities, but we actually provide um, software tools for tour operators to run their business. So if you are, you know, a business that offers parasailing in Miami, you can use our software to take online bookings and then also run your whole business, you know, from a shack on the beach right. on an iPad or an iPhone. Right. Um, so sales is an area where there's a ton of data, right, because we're looking at how much we're contacting people, um, what our conversion rates are across different parts of the sales funnel, um, how we perform post sales, how different people in the sales team might be performing. Um, and we're trying to glean lessons and learnings from that around what's working, what isn't working. And when we're doing A-B tests perhaps on things that we're trying out. So that's an area where there's a lot of data and analytics in, mm -hmm. in terms of something that might seem that it should, shouldn't have that much data. Um, people often think of sales as being an art, but there's a, a lot of it that's actually a science as well. And so that's an area that we use a ton of data around. Um, another area that we use data is around actually um, improving conversions and bookings. So, you know, we do a ton of A-B tests on our booking flows because each month we've got tens of millions of dollars of bookings that are going through our platform. So it's really important that, you know, any small incremental change in conversion, um, that can learn and turn into millions of dollars sure. of value. And so that's an area where we use a lot of data and testing in order to be able to infer What's value. anything that you noticed in that process where you're like, oh, here's... There's some gold here. We found it, and Just, let's see if we so can. It's so funny. It's the colors that you might use. It's um, it's um, you know the number of boxes of information. So you A/B test asking. all of that. Absolutely, every single step, um, and we've done that. You know, for we've got, actually got a, a customer experience team. Um, uh, on the uh, engineering side, and that's all that they're doing is actually A-B testing and, and helping with that conversion funnel and that flow. Wow, that's so, awesome. And it's made a big difference for us, actually. Sure. We've increased the conversion um, over the last couple of years by about 20% altogether, wow. um, and increased also the, um, the basket sizes as well. So that means that the, for the average business that works with us, they see a 30% increase in revenue when they start using our software. You've talked a lot about data. Has that really helped create a culture of data or has it been limited to certain pockets in the organization? I think um, data, because it's being utilized from everybody from sales to engineering is really at the heart of our business as well. I think anyone who's trying to build a company today where you're probably having a lot of interactions mm -hmm. with potentially millions of, of, of individuals means that you have to use data. So I think it's pretty integral to our business and also because of my background, um, you know, some of our team, a lot of them are uh, also people who went to business school and might have worked in finance or, right. or, or consulting before. I think we're very comfortable with data and it's actually just so much easier because otherwise people have opinions yep. um, and, you know, it doesn't matter about the opinion. Let's yeah. just look at what the data shows. And so I think it also creates a level of you being willing to try things out and maybe something sounds ridiculous, right. but why not try it? Because the cost to try is so low. Um, and then, you know, often the data surprises you. Even for myself, yeah. sometimes I, I assume something and then we'll try it out and it's completely different to what I expected. They're probably like smaller wins, but sure. it's constant. But it's all like, the little small wins It's all these small wins that right. add up. And I think that's completely the case. And I think even for us, sometimes when we had like slightly slicker, slicker opportunities, or even, you know, if you go into our app, one of the things that we do is um, we have you go through a, um, 
a kind of quiz about the things that you like and it's pictures. And, and that's actually scary because you're making someone do some work. Right. Um, but what we found was that people were much more engaged Got it. Um, as they went through and they did that work and had to pick the kind of things that they like to do uh, and pick between, um, you know, diving and a museum. Yep. And that once they gave you that information, they were actually much more engaged. And that's hard to do because... A-B testing on apps is not as nearly as easy as a website. Completely. Um, and, 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 you know, we actually ended up testing it on a website as well. Um, that was one of the reasons that we were able to do it. But it's really interesting to see stuff like that, which is counterintuitive, but actually works because it gets people more engaged. So what you've talked about conversion rates. What metrics are the most important metrics that you use to, as a CEO, whether it's about HR or conversions or anything in between that you think about the most or that you look at the most to give you the signal that things are either going well or they're not going well? So we have a series of forward-looking metrics um, in order to infer like what's going to happen in the future. Because for us, we take a cut of each booking. Yeah. Um, and so it's really important for us to see you know, how many new businesses are we working with? Um, how many activities do we have? What are, um, you know, how large is our team going out and doing that? Um, through to, you know, how many how many people are still with us and retention. So all of these different vehicles, there's about six different metrics that go into how we think um, about our forward-looking um, kind of opportunity. So I think, you know, I try to look at these growth metrics and these successful uh, as part of a success formula, yeah. um, rather than looking at backward-looking metrics. Because often, if you're only looking at like, you know, what, did that, what was our revenue last quarter? Or sure. um, how many bookings for our platform? That's often talking about the work that you did six months ago or a year ago. So I try to look at forward-looking metrics that help you understand what the business is gonna look like in a few months' time. And do you have any signals that when you see them, they're like red alerts, like raise mm -hmm. the flag, if this ever happens, I wanna know about it. Are there any Completely. micro metrics that you look at? Yeah, there are, and actually, there's almost like a traffic light piece to it, so we look at those metrics, and then we'll, we have traffic lights for them around. If they go outside of certain bands, okay, this is, a, this is a green, it's going great, all the way through to this is a red and we need to do something about it. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so you can kind of, in the end, it, having really specific numbers can get you know distracting. So we get into the bands of this is good or not. Sure. Um, and each year, at the start of the year, we'll set four or five goals. And those will be the top level, most important goals um, that you think about. Because often, if you have too much data, you can get really distracted. And so it's important just to say, okay, well, like, these are the five things we really care about sure. and that matter. I think as a CEO especially, like, there's only a handful of things you do each year that have a really big impact on the business. Right. Um, and then there's a lot of noise. And so I try to make sure that I kind of set my goals at the start of the year. I know what really matters. And then from that, that's where I'll go back and say, did we move the needle on these things? Because sometimes you can do small things um, and do the urgent and not the important. Right. And when you get into the world of that's urgant... That's easy to get yeah, sucked into that. Yeah, totally. And that, and that battle between urgent and important... Urgent normally wins, yeah. and so I think with goal setting, I try and make sure that it's the important. Exactly, that's the leader's job, right? Yeah, and then you Set keep the going vision, back to it, and you think, track. oh, wow, yeah, we did all this other stuff that was small fires, but we've not made any progress on the big things sure. we care about. So, so final two questions. Uh, first, when we talk about forward, you know, these metrics you look at, what, what does the future hold for Peak? How do you think about it? What do you want to accomplish sure. over the next three, five, 10, 20 yeah. years, what do you think about? So um, I really care about us being continuing to scale the business. So we already work with thousands of businesses, there's thousands of activities that are available. Um, but you know, in America, there are almost 100,000 tour operators um, and it's a $30 billion market. So although we've got you know, great scale, it's actually an opportunity that's hugely green. So I want to continue doing that. So yep. I want to grow the team to enable our growth. We've grown about 20x in the last couple of years. How do we continue that as we're bigger? That's really, really important to me. Um, the second thing is really around our own talent and leadership because we have these great, really bright people who come into our organization. And it's really important to me, I think as uh, the duty of a, of, a, of a CEO today, I think, is to ensure that people are the best people that they can be. Right. And so um, inspiring people to continue to be curious, to learn, to develop themselves is, is really important to me. So I think those are the two things, developing talent and, and scaling. And so as we look at the 20 year horizon. And that's kind of my second question. Yeah. Like when you think about your, your role as CEO, we, we can go a lot of different directions with that. What do you consider to be the most important priorities yeah. that you're responsible for to get the company to accomplish these kind of 20-year 
Yeah, goals. you know, well, I think we've got the opportunity to be the brand for this activity space, right? So, you know, you might think of Open Table for restaurants, or yeah. you might think of Airbnb for accommodation. You should be thinking about Peak when it comes to great activities. And so, we want to we want to be that brand, and I think we have an opportunity to do that. So, my job is really to ensure that all the steps we take over the next couple of years allow us to be there, so that in 20 years, when you think about Peak, it's totally a part of yeah. everything that you're doing. I also think we need to change people's um, relationship with um, what they spend their money and time on, right? Because I think we're in a world right now where people still spend a lot of money on products and yet they don't make us as happy. Um, experiences do make you 60% happier than buying a product. Yep. Um, it allows you to be able to build connections with the people that you care about, whether right. it's your friends or your family. And I think in a world that sometimes also doesn't allow us to perhaps have as much respect for other cultures. Um, you know, we're living through an era which, which definitely has some changes around how we perceive others. Right. Actually, you know, activities and experiences and maybe perhaps going and seeing something new will give you that perspective. So I think all of those things matter. So in general, I think that the work that we're doing, uh, our mission is to connect the world through experiences. It's really, really important for the world that we do do that. And so awesome. I'm excited to help people connect. Cool. Well, thank you very much. You, you, you. certainly uh, inspire a lot of people, and it's been awesome to just see the ambition and the confidence and in the face of so many people in a market, uh, being able to rapidly create a very quickly growing company is, is, is really amazing. So congratulations on your success you. and best of luck. Thanks so much. Thank you. Been great, we survived. Yeah, we did. No tea, oh. but we got water. Yeah, I know, we did. Cold water.